She stands at the graveside. The weeping from the mourners fills the air. Occasionally she dabs at her eyes, but there are no tears. It's just another one. Another funeral. Another payday. Is it over yet? She wonders. Can she slip out without anyone noticing? She has things to do. Paperwork to arrange. Another funeral to plan. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 149, The Serial Crimes of Rosemary Ndlovu, part one. Now it's time for my monthly tip about the latest series to watch on CBS Justice, the home of true crime on TV. And from Saturday the 23rd of March at 8pm, you can catch the South African premiere of Violent Minds, Killers on Tape. Featuring previously unheard conversations with some of the world's most notorious killers, this captivating true crime series delves into the tapes of renowned psychiatrist Dr. Al Carlyle. Once thought lost to history, his recordings captured conversations with dangerous killers, including Ted Bundy, the Hi-Fi Killers, and Manny Cortez. And these chilling tapes reach into their warped minds, revealing what drove their obsession with violence and murder. You can watch Violent Minds, Killers on Tape, on Saturday and Sundays until the 14th of April on DSTV Channel 170 and Starsat 222. And a huge thank you to CBS Justice for sponsoring this episode of True Crime South Africa. Since 2019, True Crime South Africa has been telling the stories of the victims of violent crime in South Africa. The podcast is independent. That means no big or even little corporates fund it. And that's just the way I like it. And it's the only independent podcast in South Africa that consistently charts in the top 10. Keeping a podcast like this going is time consuming. And for the most part, it remains a one woman process. It's me. I'm the one woman. You. Yes, you, are the reason this podcast continues to flourish and help bring in tips on missing person and cold cases. If you'd like to help keep the show running, please consider supporting our sponsors, signing up to Patreon or PayPal, follow the show on the socials, as the kids say, and share it with your fellow partners in crime. You can find our social links and learn more about our sponsors at True Crime South Africa forward slash donate. Shout out to this week's Patreon and PayPal superstars. A huge thank you goes out to Andani Mapalu and Agnes Chomba for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much, everyone. Patreon supporters get one additional exclusive episode a month, a shout out on the pod, and other exclusive content, including Q&As with me, as and when it's available. It's a minimum of $1 a month. I think you should do it. Please. And thank you. Keba. I don't really think I need to introduce this offender to you. Her name has become very well publicized in the years since she was convicted, And the last time I looked, there were still outstanding cases against her. But there certainly are already enough convictions for me to cover this in good conscience. Perhaps some of the reasons that Rosemary Ndlovu's crimes were so hugely publicized include the fact that she is a female offender. Violent crime female offenders do often get more publicity than male offenders. Also because she targeted her family members and close loved ones as her victims, 
And additionally, she was a police officer. On top of that, the way she used the insurance system to her benefit was utterly terrifying. And that certainly attracted a lot of attention too. I've created content around this case before. I made a companion podcast series for Showmax when they released their Showmax original documentary on this case. You'll hear some unused clips from that project in these episodes, and you'll hear an interview I did with a journalist who cracked the case. I also have another connection to this case in terms of content. Naledi Shange is a journalist who covered this case extensively, and she wrote a book about it called Killer Cop, and she'll be at the Franz Schuch Literary Festival in May, and I'll be there too, chatting with her about her book. This case is going to be covered over at least two episodes, maybe more, depending on if I find something new along the way. But if not, it'll be two. This is part one, and here I'll be focusing predominantly on Rosemary's background, her family, upbringing, childhood, and early years. Sources for this episode include Naledi Shange's book, Killer Cop, the Showmax original documentary, Rosemary's Hit List, and the material I produced for the companion podcast series by the same name. So, let's get into episode 149, The Serial Crimes of Rosemary Ndlovu, part one. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Although I would ordinarily start episodes with the victim's background where possible, In this case, because of the nature of the case and the crimes, it's actually impossible to separate the two. We cannot tell Rosemary's victims' stories without telling Rosemary's story. Their lives are intertwined, and so are the victims' deaths. Rosemary Nomia Ndlovu was born on the 27th of December 1975. The circumstances of Rosemary's birth were odd enough, at least in the 1970s, and within the culture she lived in, to safely say that the innocent baby who was Normia, Rosemary, was already set apart from others. It's reported that when Rosemary and her sister Audrey were born, their mother Sophie was in a same-sex relationship. Homosexuality was, of course, shunned in the 1970s for the most part, and certainly in South Africa in the more conservative communities. So Rosemary's mother, Maria Sophie Moshwana, lived as privately as possible with her partner, Maria Mboeni. It was easy enough for the couple to pass their relationship off as a friendship. In rural Limpopo, With many men moving to the cities for work, it was not uncommon for women to support women and to live together to pool resources. Maria Mboweni was also a well-respected Sangoma in the community, and most would think twice before speaking against her. Of course, when it came to children, the options available to same-sex couples in the 1970s were limited. Sophie, Rosemary's mother, would eventually approach a man she knew from a neighbouring village and ask him to father a child with her. He would father Rosemary and her sister Audrey for the couple as well. If this arrangement wasn't out of left field enough for the time, how Rosemary's mother Sophie and Maria Mboweni came to be a couple is equally odd. The story that's been passed down through the family is that Sophie was given to Maria Mboweni in exchange for her treating Sophie's brother. 
the family didn't have the money required for the Sangoma to treat the man's chest pains, and so Mbweni had suggested payments of a different kind, and an agreement was reached. Now, while this might sound rather shocking, and of course it is, according to her family, Sophie had no problem with the arrangement. In fact, her family members would tell journalist Naledi Shange that the community they lived in at the time was not all that conservative, and same-sex relationships were quite common. Sophie and Maria seemed to be quite happy together, but after Rosemary and Audrey were born, things changed in the relationship, and Sophie said that Maria was neglecting her and things between them were strained. According to family members, there was little food in the house, and often when they would visit, they would find young Rosemary crying outside because she hadn't eaten that day. When Sophie's sister and Rosemary's aunt, Lucy, saw what was happening, she'd taken Rosemary to live with her. Rosemary had stayed with her aunt for some time, until things between her mother and Maria had come to a head, and Sophie had fled with both of her children to a neighbouring village. Another part of the story that's been passed down through generations, at least on Rosemary's biological father's side, is that when Sophie abandoned Maria, the Sangoma had placed a curse on her. It was this curse, it has been suggested, that led to what Rosemary would end up doing. Sophie's family laughed this off, saying that Maria had been dead for a long time before Rosemary had started committing her crimes, and if there was any curse, it was that Rosemary was cursed by an intense love for money. Now, Sangomas and traditional healers come up a lot in this case. And as I've mentioned before, if you haven't grown up in a culture that has a traditional healer of some kind as part of its base belief system, you're likely to roll your eyes and express incredulity. But there are many things that others of us have grown up with in our own cultural systems that would seem entirely foreign and strange to those who do have traditional healers within their cultural system. It's kind of like growing up being told the sky is blue, only to meet someone who grew up being told the color of the sky is called orange. Maybe neither of you is wrong. Maybe it's just the label you've slapped on it. Either way, traditional healers and sangomas are a huge part of our country and its people's lives. And it's also something that is deeply misunderstood. When Showmax created their original documentary, Rosemary's Hit List, they interviewed a woman named Gogo Dineo Ndlazi. Gogo Dineo is a preeminent and pioneering Sangoma who successfully merged the sacredness of African spirituality with modern thinking. She's a celebrated spiritual teacher, a life coach, African storyteller, actress, writer, dancer, and trained facilitator. Teaching is at the heart of what Gogo Dineo does. She's also one of those rare people who managed to bridge the gap between those who know and those who don't. And we need more people like that. I had a huge number of light bulb moments when listening to Gogo Tineo's insights in the documentary. I wanted to include some of Gogo Tineo's insights here in this episode because I think they add incredible value in helping us to frame the background of the case we're talking about because these murders were not committed in a vacuum, and the offender and the victims were impacted by cultural aspects that I, as a host, do not have a lived experience of, and some listeners may not either. So the following is a clip from an interview I did with Gogo Dineo, explaining some of the challenges she comes up against in trying to get two worlds to meet in a harmonious way. Here's what she had to say. 
So I think one uh, one of the barriers is just religion. So how dogmatic religion becomes and therefore will invalidate anything else that does not subscribe to its philosophies. Yes, so the minute I speak about the work I have to do, then I have to make a choice between the work that I do and my practice and God. But you don't get to ask a psychologist to do that, you know. So that's one, uh, because it's like, do you believe in God or not? You know, and if you believe, so we, I face a lot of interrogation and somewhat I need to prove the work that I do, you know, uh, according to somebody else's standards. It needs to fit in my framework. Otherwise, if it doesn't fit in my framework, it doesn't exist, right? And I always say to people, just because you don't believe it's there, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Just because you don't believe that Rosemary used a lot of dark stuff to get away with things for so long. It doesn't mean she didn't use it. It's not only that, you know, the justice system has been incompetent. We know that it's, you know, it's got its struggles, but people do things in the, you know, you know, in the paranormal and people think, no, it's, it's not, it's not there. So that's one. The other, the second thing is people needing to keep you in the box as they know you to be. So with me, the challenge is like it can be. You can be a Sangoma and be so eloquent, articulate, and be so insightful and be, you know, and know as much as you know. And this is mostly from actually the Black community. The discomfort of me being able to share and express things in the way that I do is from my is from my own community. Like, what is she doing there? What does she know? She's just a Sangoma, you know because the expectation is for me to make mediocre right of the practice is for me to speak about the gruesome stuff there's things i refuse to express in the documentary because they're sacred mm -hmm. and i said i can't share those things because we could be watch we can have another rosemary watching the rosemary yes. who's going to be listening to this interview and be like wow thank you Coco. now i know how to get away with second matter you know because there are we know with serial killers there are other serial killers who look up to them and start to worship mm -hmm. them and mimic their behavior yeah. right because that's that's how the criminal mind is wired so mm -hmm. i was like no i'm not going to reveal that but secondly i can't reveal something that is sacred and when you are watching as an and as an outsider you are not immense in that particular practice it makes it very hard because spiritual healing requires one to go through the experience to fully understand what we are actually doing it's mm. not only in me saying we're going to do one two three but you the one two three steps make sense when you are in them so that's the other thing and i also didn't want to just expose and jeopardize the community of practice for the sake of being insightful and educational so from my own community we are used to healers coming in platforms like that and speaking around how they actually then would mix this and take this and take this human blood and like the gruesomeness of it becomes mm. quite exciting. And then it it then does goes, you see, it puts the stamp of approval. This is what we said about these people. Look how evil they are, because look at who this one is saying. So in the work that I do, I have to be conscious that Yes, part of my calling is to teach, but in my teaching, I should not be compromising everybody else for the sake of teaching. You can still teach without overexposing information. So these are some of the challenges, you know, even mm -hmm. people coming, then expecting us to do what they believe that we do. When I was asked about Izinkabi, for example, I said, I, I know there's a lot of evil that goes down there. I don't do it and I don't have interest because I'm not called to condone such behavior. Because for me, how I got trained and one of the code of ethics I was given is I am a life giver. I do not take life. I don't help people taking life. The minute I do that, I move away from my work as a, you know, the one who facilitates mm. life giving. So I needed, to, I, I, therefore it means that I don't then become interested in things that says you've actually consciously and intentionally for, you know, for your own desire have taken a life because it fulfills either a monetary value or it fulfills a particular status or it fulfills whatever it fulfills in you, you know, and here I am and I'm saying I'm Isangoma, I'm supposed to make well what is not well. 
but I'm actually just making sure that your own individual desire is fulfilled at the expense of the collective. Like I said, we mm. are interconnected at the expense of the collective. Mine is to restore things to harmony and balance at the collective. Because as a healer, I'm looking at how do we keep the system healthy? Your system as a person that is made of the different parts of the system that I've alluded to earlier on, but yeah. also you are part of the community. You know, your community is part of the family. Your family is part of society. The society is part of, you know, the nation. The nation is part of the global community. So mm -hmm. as you heal as a healer, you're thinking of, what are the consequences? Because one of the natural laws that we operate from, we know that every action has a consequence. What I put in here is going to come out. So when it comes out, who is going to be affected as well? What we see today in South Africa is this chasm between people who've grown up perhaps in traditionally African homes, now living in a very modern and westernized culture. And that can be extremely disconcerting. One doesn't want to throw away one's home culture. And certainly you can't because your older family members are still deeply entrenched in the culture. And there's value in embracing the traditions of your family and community of birth. But the modern westernized world doesn't allow for these beliefs to be held on to. So many black South Africans find themselves in this in-between world where traditional healers and sangomas are still very much part of their culture of birth. But if they want to hold on to the value this provides, they need to find a way to straddle both worlds. And I think this is exactly what we see in Rosemary's case. We see the victims, the perpetrator, the people around each and even the police, straddling these two worlds, all while being hunted by a killer. So I guess my reasoning for delving into this at this point is so that whenever we hear reference to traditional healer or sankoma come up in this case, we don't shut down part of our brain, because it's all relevant and important to the lived experience of the victims and the perpetrator, and therefore incredibly important to the case itself, perhaps not legally, but definitely psychologically. Once you're finished listening to this episode, if you haven't listened to the Rosemary's Hitless Companion podcast series, I highly recommend you do so. There's a whole interview with Coco Deneo in episode four, and it's fascinating. Perhaps what I found most interesting in this information about Rosemary's origins is that it wasn't included in the Showmax documentary. And I first discovered the information in Naledi Shange's book. At the time of the documentary, we were all working from the reports that had been released about Rosemary's background during her court case. And a lot of that came from Rosemary herself. So, firstly, it's quite interesting that this didn't come up at that stage, because surely it could have had some psychological relevance that her lawyer would have tried to use. But it also makes me wonder why Rosemary would not have shared this for that very reason. Either way, Rosemary and her sister Audrey moved with her mother to another village when they were very young. Rosemary's biological father apparently did try to track them down, but was not successful, and he died shortly afterwards. Sophie would go on to have another five children. The family lived in deep poverty for most of their lives, but education was very important to the family, and Rosemary had always said she either wanted to be a teacher or a police officer. Rosemary was 18 years old when she met Hand Koza in 1994. Hand was already in a relationship with a woman who'd given birth to a daughter with him when he met Rosemary, and he was soon smitten. Hand was in his late 20s when he met Rosemary, so he was quite a bit older than her. He worked for the local tribal authority council 
and had a good job. And when Rosemary announced that she was pregnant, he brought her home to introduce her to his family. He told them that he planned to make Rosemary his wife. At first, his family were a little unsure, but the young woman seemed pleasant enough. She was polite and well-dressed and beautiful, and they figured Hand could do far worse. In 1995, Rosemary gave birth to a son they named Jaunty, and she and the child and Hand lived happily together. Jaunty was only a few years old, though, when Rosemary announced that she was going to Gauteng. She decided to join the police service, and she wanted to start right away. Hand was taken aback, but soon adjusted to the idea. Rosemary hadn't been in Gauteng for very long, though, when the relationship started to suffer. She hardly ever wanted to come back home to visit. When she did, she only stayed for a few days. Worse yet, as far as Hand was concerned, when he wanted to visit Rosemary while he was on leave, she wouldn't allow it. She refused to tell him where she was living. The marriage was on incredibly thin ice. In 2004, Hand Corza fell ill. He was hospitalized, and his wife Rosemary surprised everyone by staying at his bedside tending to him. When Hand's condition deteriorated and he remained hospitalized, Rosemary occasionally returned to Johannesburg to work and then went straight back to Hand's bedside. She even bought a cell phone for him and his family to use to remain in contact. Then, one day after Hand had been in hospital for several weeks and wasn't getting any better, Rosemary arrived at his family's home took back the cell phone she'd given them, and told them she was returning to Johannesburg. Hand Corza died the next day. His family was naturally devastated. He had been occasionally ill up until his hospitalization, and although the doctors thought he may have had a strain of tuberculosis, his symptoms while he was in hospital didn't add up to that diagnosis. Jaunty was in deep mourning for his father, and his mother was of little consolation. She didn't return to the home immediately upon hearing of Han's death, but she did attend the funeral. Han's brother said he wasn't really sure that she was actually crying at his brother's graveside. And her behavior afterwards disturbed everyone. She immediately inquired about his pension payout and seemed annoyed to discover he'd made his son, Jaunty, his sole beneficiary. The money would go into a trust for Jaunty, which would pay out when he turned 18. There are claims that there was a life insurance policy too, though, which went to Rosemary, but Han's family didn't have any proof of that. The house that Hand had built for them to live in had been up until then occupied by Hand and Jaunty, with Rosemary living in Johannesburg. Jaunty had been in the care of his grandmother, Hand's mother, since his father had fallen ill, and within a few days of Hand's death, Rosemary sold the entire house, including the furniture. Hand's family said they knew nothing about it, until the new owner arrived to take occupation. The family were baffled by Rosemary's behavior after Han's death. She came back once a year to clean Han's grave, but had little interaction with the family at all. Then, in 2008, she told the family that she wanted Jaunty to come and stay with her in Johannesburg while he was on school holidays. Jaunty had never been to visit his mother there, but was keen to spend some time with her. Rosemary also mentioned that she might see about getting him enrolled in a school there for the new year. She said she'd prefer for him to be in a Model C school, and his uncle agreed this might be a good thing for him. The man mentions 
that Rosemary had asked him to sign some paperwork, which she said would be necessary for enrolling Jaunty into school. It's unknown what this paperwork was, but it would seem strange that the child's biological mother would require a signature from a child's uncle to enrol him in school. We'll likely never know what those papers really were, or if they had any significance to what happened next. Jaunty hugged his grandmother, uncles, aunts and cousins goodbye, and told them he'd see them again in a few weeks. They would never see him alive again. Jaunty had only been at his mother's house in Johannesburg for a few days when he was admitted to Arve Hospital in Kempton Park. The Causa family was told that the young man had accidentally ingested poison. They found this incredibly strange, as Jaunty was 13 years old, hardly a baby or a toddler who would mistake poison for something else. Rosemary couldn't explain how it had happened. After spending a few days in hospital, Jaunty seemed to improve enough to be discharged, and Rosemary took him back to her house. She informed the Causa family that he was doing better, and everything seemed fine. The very next day, though, she called again to say that Jaunty was dead. The Causa family were horrified. A week later, Jaunty's body arrived back in Bushbuck Ridge, and he was laid to rest near his father. His aunt on his father's side told Shomax producers that she'd paid for Jaunty's funeral herself. Meanwhile, Jaunty's death made Rosemary the beneficiary of the trust fund her husband's pension had been paid into. 12,000 rand was paid out to her soon afterward, and the cause of family still wonder what that paperwork they signed was, and whether that related to another policy against Jaunty's life, perhaps. Rosemary completely distanced herself from the Causa family after that. She would occasionally visit her son and husband's graves, but made no effort to speak with her in-laws. Rosemary and Lovu was, by this point, a police officer with the SAPS. She was working her way up the ranks, and by most accounts, at least at that point, well respected by her colleagues. She was stationed at Tembisa Police Station. After Jaunty's death, an unnatural death investigation was opened, of course, but investigators looking for the docket years later found it no longer existed. It had been opened at Tembisa SAPS, but then it had mysteriously disappeared. An autopsy was done on Jaunty Causa, and tissue samples were taken for further toxicology. But again, years later, when investigators tried to follow up on Jaunty's suspicious death, his autopsy report had been signed out by an unknown person and it disappeared with the docket. And his toxicology results? Well, they were never actually run. The tissue samples were still in storage, though. Again, years later. But sadly, whatever Jaunty had actually died from had degenerated in the samples enough by then that nothing conclusive was found when the tests were finally run. In 2008, though, Jaunty's extended family had no suspicions about his death beyond it being a horrible accident. In their minds, he'd accidentally ingested something he shouldn't have, and it had taken its toll on his young body. And maybe that is what happened. Or maybe not. It is important to state that Rosemary and Lovu has never been charged with or convicted of anything related to the deaths of her husband, Hand Koza, or her son, Jaunty Koza. But it really is 
a lot of food for thought, isn't it? And pretty darn horrific, either way. Rosemary was now officially single and seemed to be enjoying life. Many would note that she seemed to live a far higher standard of life than a police officer's salary should afford. She did enjoy gambling a lot, and often took loans from loan sharks. And by the time Rosemary met a new man in 2010, her finances seemed on rocky ground. Maurice Mabasa knew nothing of Rosemary's tragic past when he met her, though. All he saw was an intelligent, accomplished woman who really seemed like everything he wanted in a partner, at least at first. And that's where I'm going to leave it for part one. I'll be back in your feed with part two before you know it. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.